It gives me great pleasure to introduce Mark Doty tonight. His numerous honors include the National Book Critics Circle Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, the Whiting Writers Award, and the Penn Martha Albrand Award for First Nonfiction. His collection, Fire to Fire, New and Selected Poems, won the National Book Award for Poetry in 2008. He is the only American poet to have received the T.S. Eliot Prize in the UK and received fellowships from the Guggenheim, Ingram Merrill, and Lila Wallace Reader's Digest Foundations, and from the National Endowment for the Arts. His eight books of poems include School of the Arts, Source, and My Alexandria. He has also published four volumes of nonfiction prose, Still Life with Oysters and Lemon, Required Reading, Heaven's Coast, Firebird, and Dog Years, which, won, which was a New York Times bestseller in 2007. His poems appear in numerous magazines, including The Atlantic Monthly, The London Review of Books, Plowshares, Poetry, and The New Yorker. Mark Doty, advocate of intimacy, let us now be drawn into your orbit. Thank you. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> um, it's really, it's a pleasure to be here to, to read with Marjorie. Um, it's great. And uh, what a day. Um, my partner and I drove up from New York City uh, along the what with our dogs. Um, along the way, uh, somewhere south of, of Binghamton, we came to a sign in the road that said Swan Lake. <laughs> I, I, you, know, you cannot drive past that exit, right? I mean, we got to stop there. And Swan Lake turns out to be um, a, a lakeside resort where there is a huge abandoned hotel uh, built maybe around the turn of the century, remodeled some of the 50s, and then they just walked away. So there's this hulk. And there's a lovely body of water, which the dogs just took to. It was a fabulous day. Um, and uh, let's see. I also, uh, hearing you know, uh, Marjorie's wonderful little um, monastic tale to be in her reading, um, I want to tell you one, too. Um, last summer, I taught a poetry workshop at Tassajara, which is a uh, mountain Zen center, uh, famous for the Tassajara bread book, which some of you will know it's cookbook. It's uh, in the mountains above Carmel Valley. You go seven miles of a winding, extremely steep dirt road, and then seven miles down the other side. Uh, I was there for a week, no phone, no internet. And about six in the morning, a Zen work crew would be outside the door of my room preparing to start their day's tasks. And they would be chanting something along the lines of, um, the past no longer exists. The future is not yet here. All we have is now. Death is imminent. Prepare for it. So with that in mind, you know, <laughs> the day was launched. Now, um, yeah, which will sort of set a tone for things, you know. Um, so uh, finally, before I start reading to you, and what I'm going to do is read for you um, new poems, uh, which are from a manuscript that is very, very nearly complete. Um, I just want to say it's wonderful to be um, in the place, in the company of, of, of great writers. Um, uh, Bruce, whose poems I, I've admired for a very, very long time, and um, the uh, irreplaceable Johnny Tevis, who was my dissertation advisee um, some years ago. And, and nothing makes you feel better than being uh, the teacher of a wonderful writer. You know? yeah. This year, this last year, um, for the first time, a student of mine uh, won the Pulitzer in poetry. And um, I said to a friend of mine, I just had my first student win the Pulitzer. And she said, first, how many do you think they're going to be? <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> Stand back. So, um, let's see. I have written a number of poems in which a member of the canine species does something of interest. And um, the speaker of the poem then, then uh, engages in a kind of meditation, aesthetic, uh, philosophical, psychological about this incident. And I actually uh, did so many of these poems that I, I sort of made a rule that I would write no more um, until I got a new dog <laughs> whose name is Ned. He's a golden retriever. And um, it keeps getting more and more interesting as, as time goes on. And thus, this is the first of his poems. It's called Deep Lame. June 23rd, evening of the first fireflies. We're walking in the cemetery down the road, and I look up from my distracted study of whatever, an unfocused gaze somewhere a few feet ahead of me on the grass. 
and see that Ned has run on with the champagne plume of his tail held especially high, his head erect, which is often a sign that he has something he believes he is not allowed to have. <laughs> and in the gathering twilight, what is it that is gathered? Who is doing the harvesting? I can make out that the long horizontal between his lovely jaws is one of the four stakes planted on the slope to indicate where the backhoe will dig a new grave. Of course, my impulse is to run after him, out of respect for the rule that we won't desecrate the tombs, or at least for the particular knowledge of those who knew the woman whose name inks a placard in the rectangle claimed by the four poles of vanishing, three poles now, and how it's within their recollection, their gathering, she'll live. Evening of memory, spark lamps in the grass. I stand and watch him go in his wild figure eights. I say, you run, darling, you tear up that hill. Well, you may have noticed that that poem has a title, Deep Lane, which has ostensibly nothing to do with it. Uh, Deep Lane is a road uh, near a house I have uh, way out at the end of Long Island. And it's a, a perfectly handsome little road. But what I really love about it is the name, the two monosyllables, the two long vowels, deep lane, the sense of descent and going forward. And I found myself obsessing about that phrase. And uh, it seemed to become a kind of mantra, drawing meanings to itself. So I wrote a deep lane poem. And when I had finished it, um, I realized I wasn't done. And I wrote another one. And now there are about 15 of them. <laughs> so this is the second one. Um, this one has to do with the experience of um, inheriting a garden that has been planted by someone else. And for gardeners, uh, this means that everything must be changed. Right? Nothing will do unless you do it yourself. So at some point during the hauling and lugging, I started to ask myself what it was for. Also, this poem remembers the late Deborah Diggs, a marvelous poet who um, died by her own hand now uh, about three years ago. Deep Lane. When I'm down on my knees, pulling up wild mustard by the roots before it sets seed, hauling the old ferns further into the shade, I'm talking to the anvil of darkness. Break table. Slab no blow could dent, rung with the making. And out of that chop and rot comes the fresh surf of the lupins. When the shovel slips into white root flesh, into the meat coursing with cool water, when I'm grubbing on my knees, what is the hammer? Dusky skin of the tuber, naked worms who write on the soil every letter. My companion blind, all day we go digging, harrowing, rooting deep. Spade plunge and trowel, Sweet turned down gas flame, slow charring carbon, out of which sprouts the wild unsayable. Beauty's the least of it. You get ready, like Deborah, who used to garden in the dark, hauling out candles and a tall glass of what she said was tea, and digging and reading and studying in the dirt. She'd bring a dictionary. If study is prayer, she said, I'm praying. If you've already gone down to the anvil, if you've rested your face on that adamantine, maybe you're already changed. This uh, deep lane poem um, makes a use of a rather arcane theological term, Manichaeanism. And Manichaeism is the notion that the world is equally divided between forces of good and evil, and darkness and light, and that the outcome of the struggle between these forces is not yet known. This was a uh, declared heretical by the church about uh, 400 AD. But it, it, one can make a case for it. <laughs> Deep lane. Into Eden came the ticks, princes of this world, heat-seeking, tiny, multitudinous. Lord, why have you given them a heart, a nervous system, a lit microchip of a brain, is it, if not to invite Manichaeanism? Hard to believe, the force that shaped the mild tortoise traversing the undergrowth with smallest steps, the sway-necked lily. Hard to countenance that same mind dotting paradise with pinhead demons wanting nothing but to gorge, to suck beyond the dreams of their hell brothers, the mosquitoes. 
implacable, without boundary, pure appetite. I wouldn't know anything about that. <laughs> this poem um, concerns the experience. I know you've had this experience. Um, buying a used book without really looking inside and discovering that you now own someone else's marginalia, which can never be ignored. <laughs> never. And uh, I am sorry to report, this happened to me with an edition of Leaves of Grass, my favorite book in the world, pretty much. And I was going to teach a class. Um, I, I had forgotten my book. So I run into the nearest used bookstore. And of course, there is a copy of Leaves of Grass in every used bookstore in America, if not in the world. And um, I buy the book. I wanted to bring my students um, the opening, well, it's section six of Song of Myself, and it's the part that begins, a child said, what is the grass? Fetching it to me with full hands. How could I answer the child? I do not know what it is any more than he. What is the grass? On the margin, in the used text I purchased without opening, pale, green, dutiful vessel, some unconvinced student has written in a clear, looping hand, isn't it grass? <laughs> How could I answer the child? <laughs> I do not exaggerate. I think of her question for years. <laughs> and while first I imagine her the very type of the incurious, revealing the difference between a mind at rest and one that cannot, later I come to imagine that she had faith in language. That was the difference. She believed that the word settled things. The matter need not be looked into again. <laughs> and he who'd written his book over and over, nearly ruining it, so enchanted by what had first compelled him, for him the word settled nothing at all. Which, of course, is why Leaves of Grass is so enormous. <laughs> he could never finish. I have a friend, a painter, um, named Robert Harms, and uh, he is working in uh, sort of a third, fourth generation now abstract expressionist working on Long Island. He was the studio assistant of the great painter Joan Mitchell, who was, um, you know, worked in an age of heroic painters, and, and because she was a woman, her work, you know, sort of never was seen in its day on the, the scale of, you know, it should have been seen next to de Kooning, next to Pollock. Um, so, Robert, um, has, you know, as an expressionist, he looks at the world and he does something, which is a response to it, not intended to represent it, but somehow to embody his seeing. So um, this is called Robert Harms Paints the Surface of Little Fresh Pond. And you, you'll notice towards the end of the poem that the subject changes a little bit. Robert Harms Paints the Surface of Little Fresh Pond. Surface the action of the day a means of tracing the dynamic so that an extravagance of blues sparked by little coals, sun a glimmer of the day's intent. He knows to trace the alphabet written on water is to surface the action of the day, a way of proceeding, entering into the endless, the never to be repeated messages, a way of reading what could only be translated by one versed in surface, the action of the day. When my eye nearly failed, the frail foil back torn, a sudden intrusion of curls like smoke animated by this motion. What I saw was just this, what he sees on and in water, the action of surface notated, become beloved, a way of participating, a form of pleasure. So um, what that last bit of the, the poem is describing is the experience of um, a detached retina which was the scariest thing that ever happened to me in my life. And uh, it took me a long time to, to find any way to, to speak about it or to begin to write about it. And I found myself um, thinking about how grateful I was for ordinary occasions of seeing. Um, I am, uh, you know, as, as a poet who lives by the image, to me the world is received by the eye and then translated it to the work of the ear. So this is a poem of gratitude for seeing. It's called To the Eye. That rectangle of meadow on Fireplace Road, built entirely of a single grass that shades near the top, retriever blonde or russet, not without that, no. 
across a brief expanse of black bay water on the South Ferry, hood of the car pulled right to the prow rope, the lamps of where we're headed drawing nearer. Not without those. And Ned thundering toward me when he's turned from whatever and suddenly remembered I'm here, bounding into my aura with a visible single-mindedness. That. And Alex, the dear ache in his face, which in turn makes me ache in pity and in desire. The way that nothing in Vermeer has an edge. You could not describe this adequately. Nothing would ever allow you to see it. Even when my eye first failed in a restaurant on 17th Street and my field of vision filled with swirls of dark smoke, elegant in their scrolling progression, or the next day when it began to snow in my right eye, and even later when I was blind, which meant that Sixth Avenue was, el was elongated and distorted and pink because I saw it through a haze of my own blood, and now and then a color swam toward me like something carried on a flood. Even that, endless gratitude, was the thing I would without be not myself, not anyone I know. We'll go back to Deep Lane for a moment. Deep Lane. There's a line from Whitman in this poem. You'll recognize it, I think, when you hear it. We began to think the white fish individual, the one of the pair who'd struggled, after all, when our pond's colder water shot and he lay pulsing in the shallows till we thought him all but gone, then simply drew himself up, if that were something a fish could do, and swam away. A heron ate his mate. He seemed all the more than singular. He surfaced in March after his first season entombed in the bottom mud, unscathed, a four-inch emperor in his white silk coat insignia of the kingdom, splashed over his back the color of candied orange rind. He'd nose up out of the lily murk when our shadows crossed his borders, pushed to the edge to open the translucent white ring of his mouth over and over, as if begging, as if, seems to want, seems to feel. But as we knew him, semblance fell away. We felt the presence of the soul of him if soul could be understood as specificity. So that when he himself was swallowed, white appetite perched on the roof, bill raised in the air, the throat unrelenting, the absence in the pond grew resonant, a sort of empty ringing. Where were the details then, the gestures that had marked him? Heap stones, an elder, mowing, and pulpweed. How can I take any pleasure in this garden? I spent um, a semester uh, at Stanford, uh, so I had a wonderful time wandering around these little towns around uh, the Bay Area. And these are two poems that grow out of that experience. This one um, is set um, on the pier in Santa Cruz Harbor, where you can stand and watch the creatures who are here described. It's called Perfect Repose. Turning so effortlessly, you wouldn't call it that, what they do, sliding easily over, the kind of oscillation on their sides, most of them, floating together in their troop, perhaps 25 of them, just off the pier, though you couldn't count them, the sea lions. They curve around one another, two break away, one joins, the group drifts with the tide. Whose slipper or tail rays of the sun? Whose head lifted out of the green? They lie a little beneath the surface, now and then turning the face up to breathe, which is suddenly how you know they're asleep. Simultaneous, intimate, soft, plosive, a little wet. And though one coughs now and then, water in the nose, the single thing they make of many, still and always moving, as if air were also a wave, now arrived at the drifting shore of what pronoun? I mean thou, all breathe in, again at once. Pescadero, which is uh, the name of one, it's a beautiful little town. Pescadero. The little goats like my mouth and fingers. And one stands up against the wire fence and taps on the fence board, a hoof made blacker by the dirt of the field. Pushes her mouth forward to my mouth so that I can see the smallish squared seeds of her teeth 
and the bristle whispers, and then she kisses me, though I know it doesn't mean kiss. Then leans her head way back, arcing her spine, goat yoga, all pleasure and greeting, and then good-natured indifference. She loves me. She likes me a lot. She takes interest in me. She doesn't know me at all, or need to, having thus acknowledged me. Though I am all happiness, since I have been welcomed by the field's small envoy, and the splayed hoof, fragrant with soil, has rested on the fence board beside my hand. That poem um, came out in a national magazine, and it produced like, the best mail I have ever gotten. <laughs> um, that was a, a goat farmer uh, in Oregon who, who wanted to get to know me. Um, <laughs> um, some citizens of Pescadero were thrilled to see their town represented. And the very best uh, letter came from a teacher at an alternative school in the Bay Area, where every year the kindergarten class goes to the goat farm in Pescadero. And the first graders, who didn't get to go, read my poem, and reminisced about their trip. <laughs> a wonderful fate for a poem. <laughs> so um, I'm going to end with something very new, and um, it's um, you know if, if that means if you hear it again, um, it maybe it'll look a little different. We'll see. But it's it's done enough to read. Um, and the poem. Um, The title, I don't know how to say it. the title of the poem is "This Year Home Now," and it really needs to be like "This Year Home Now," but you know, it's hard to do that with Phil Kavitsa. <laughs> You'll see what. This Year Home Now. For years, I went to the Peruvian barbers on 18th Street, comforting, like anything repeated over time. Welcome. The full coat rack, three chairs held by three barbers, the eldest by the window, the middle one a slight fellow who spoke an oddly feminine, high-pitched Spanish, the youngest last, red-haired, self-consciously masculine. In each of their mirrors, their children's photos, mildly smutty cartoons, postcards from Machu Picchu. I was happy to sit in any chair, though I liked best the touch of the eldest, who rest his hand against my neck in a thoughtless, confident way. Ten years, maybe. One day, the powdery blue steel shutters pulled down over the window and door, not to be raised again. I heard they'd lost their lease, moved to a shop on 7th, but there the Russian owner gave them only two days a week, so they'd be camped for, where, Washington Heights? I didn't anticipate the loss I'd feel. What little hair I have requires neither art nor science. But this fuzz around what I'd like to think the sculptural presence of my skull means to me intensely. Two haircuts on 7th, one on Dublin, nothing, one in Dublin, then nothing right. I hear my friend Marie laughing over my shoulder, saying, in your poems, there's always a then. And I think, is it a poem without a then? Then, dull early winter. <laughs> Back on 18th, just past the post office trucks, up spiraling red in a cylinder of glass, where did that emblem come from? How did it come to signify? Just below the line of the sidewalk, a new sign, Willie's Barbershop. Hunt to find the entry, dark hallway, glass door, and there's presumably Willie, speaking Spanish in an inscrutable accent. When I tell him I used to go down the street, he says, this your home now. <laughs> <sighs> puts me in a chair and asks me what I want, and soon he's clipping and singing along with the radio. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. <laughs> That's when I notice Willie's walls. He's been here all of a week, but spangled with images hung in all barbershops since the beginning of time. Lounge singers, near celebrities, random boxers, Italian boys, Puerto Rican, caught in the hour of their beauty, though they'd scowl at the word. Frank Sinatra scribbling love to Willie. Somebody at the bat, two cheering victors over a trophy won for what? Frames already dusty, already at slight angles. Here, it is clear forever. Our barber shops like aspens, each sprung from a common root 10,000 years old, sons of one father. The best ones, the old ones, hold up fighters and starlets to hold at bay the tenderness in their hearts. Willie defies time, our kind, neutral guardian his chair, our ferry boat. And we go down into the trance of touch and the skull buzz drone of the clipper, singing cranial nerves in the direction of peace. 
And so I understand that in the endless hallway leading into the back of this nothing building on 18th Street, the men I have outlived await their turns, the fevered and wasted whose mothers and lovers scattered their ashes and gave away their clothes. 20 years, and their names tumble into a deep well, a numb well, though in truth, I have not forgotten one of you. May I never forget one of you. And beyond you, in rooms too deep and densely packed to ever see into, all the rest, compressed in their no longer breathing ranks. Willie, I have not lived well in my grief for them. I have loved this weight from place to place as if it were mine to account for. And today I sit in your good chair in the sixth decade of my life. And if your back door is the threshold of the kingdom of the lost, here is a good steady hand on my shoulder. Guardian, detached companion, go down into the deep, still waters of the chair and you come up refreshed, ready to walk the avenue. Maybe I do believe we will not be left comfortless that after everything comes tumbling down, or you tear it down and stumble in the shadow valley trenches of the moon, there's still a decent chance that a barbershop, Christmas on the radio, the instruments of Redoul wielded effortlessly, and who'd have thought for you? Willie, if he is Willie, fusses much longer over my head than my head merits, which allows me to be grateful without qualification. Maybe I've seen enough to be a little satisfied. There's a man who loves me are dogs, 10 or 20 more good years, if I'm a bit careful. There's what I haven't written. It's sunny out, though cold. After I tip Willie, I'm going down to Jane Street to a coffee shop I like, and then I'm gonna write this poem. Then. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Very sweet. So this is actually this is sort of like a related poem in a way. So it's a good place to stop. Um, let's see. A poem I don't need to tell you a thing about. Um, spent. Late August morning, I go out to cut spent and faded hydrangeas washed greens, russets, troubled little auras of sky, as if these were the very silks of Versailles, modeled by rain and ruin, then half restored after all this time. When I come back with my handful, I realize I've accidentally locked the door and can't get back into the house. The dining room window's easiest. Crawl through beauty bush and spirea, push aside some errant maples, take down the wood frame screen, hoist myself up, but how exactly to clamber across the sill and the radiator down to the tile? I try bending one leg in, but I don't fold readily. I push myself up so that my waist rests against the sill and lean forward, place my hands on the floor, and begin to slide down into the room, which makes me think this is what it was like to be born. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> Too big for the passageway. Negotiate, submit. When I give myself to gravity, there I am, inside, no harm, the dazzling, splotchy flower heads scattered around me on the floor. Will leaving the world be the same? Uncertainty as to how to proceed, some discomfort, and suddenly you're where? I am so involved with this idea, I forget to unlock the door. So when I go out to fetch the mail, I'm locked out again. Am I at home in this house? Would I prefer to be out here where I could be almost anyone? This time it's simpler. The window frame, the radiator, my descent. Born twice in one day. In their silver jug, these bruised blessed flowers. How hard I had to work to bring them into the room. When I say spent, I don't mean they have no coin. If there are lives to come, I think they might be a little easier than this one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.